And welcome everyone to In the Cage with Bards, hosted proudly on InTheCage.ca. I, of course, am your warm and convivial host, Carlin Bardsley, here to bring you the best in MMA talk. It is the most fun you can have without being punched in the face. And joining me today, I am very proud to welcome a man who will be taking part in the UFC's debut in the Philippines, May 16th. He'll be uh, taking on Zhang LePang on that card. BC's own Ragin, Cajun Johnson. How are you doing, Cajun? I'm awesome, man. I'm awesome. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, great to talk to you again. And uh, you got to be excited, man. I mean, uh, you're going out conquering new worlds. You finally got that call to the UFC. Uh, I know it was a long time coming for you. Uh, how did it feel when you finally made your UFC debut proper at, in front of an adoring hometown crowd in Vancouver? Uh, it was a pretty incredible experience, you know, like... Other than, of course, the outcome, which was uh, less than desirable on my behalf, but uh, other than that, it was amazing. Like I had pretty much every single person that I cared about there watching me fight, and that had never happened before. Um, even the ability to fight in Vancouver, I fought on one of the very first sanctioned shows ever in like 2004 uh, in Vancouver, but it had been made illegal in in Vancouver for pretty much the entire time that I was actually living in and around the uh, Lower Mainland. So it was really, really cool to be able to share my skills with all the people that had seen me training and, and knew that I was a fighter but never actually saw me live in competition before. It was a really cool experience. You mentioned that uh, there was a lot of difficulties. Uh, I used to live in Vancouver as well, so I know uh, with uh, the commission there and just getting any sort of MMA card off the ground uh, seemed to be a real headache for you. Uh, what was the attitude like uh, backstage? Uh, was there any... Uh, uh, pushback from any commission members, or have they made their peace with it since that first Chuck Liddell card? Uh, I think they've really made the peace with it, as far as I know anyway. I don't know all the inner workings uh, of the organization, but um, as far as I know, they've made peace with it. I never saw any uh, resistance for anybody from anybody. I never uh, experienced any negative uh, interactions with any of the members of the commission, so it was all good on my behalf. All right, well, that's good news. All right, now the shoe's on the other foot. You're heading into Southeast Asia and uh, taking on someone who is from there. They're going to get, obviously, the hometown crowd behind them. Uh, how does it feel uh, going in, probably playing the villain in this instance? Uh, well, I just see it, as a, see it as an opportunity to make new fans. Um, I've, I'm, I'm experienced, I've, I've experienced being the favorite. I've experienced being the underdog. I've, I've experienced being the hometown guy. I've experienced being the guy that's from another town coming in to fight the hometown guy. I've been booed, I've been cheered. I've had pretty much everything that can possibly happen to a fighter happen to me already. So it's just another experience, man. I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming whatever comes. Uh, I don't expect to, be, to get a huge standing ovation when I go out there, but I know that when I leave, I will get one. <laughs> Sounds good. And I saw recently that you said uh, great entrances and great fights seem to go hand in hand for you. So do you have anything special planned for May 16th? I'm just going to be myself, man. Like In my last fight, uh, I, there was a lot of pressure on me. Uh, coming off of the loss was, a, was one issue. And then as well, um, being like my debut in the UFC in my hometown with all these people around, which gave me a lot of positive energy, but it also put a tremendous amount of pressure on me. Um, I was a little bit angrier, a little bit more intense. Uh, and I wasn't really my like happy smiley self. Generally, if you see me in my walkout and I'm like happy and dancing, I almost always kill the guy. Uh, if, you, if I go out there and I'm like angry or or like really intense, then um, it's kind of a toss up. It'll go one way or the other. All right. What does it mean to you to be fighting on the UFC's Filipino debut uh, in front of uh, what I'm sure is going to be a very raucous crowd and a crowd that's never been able to see live UFC before? Oh, I'm stoked, man. Like because of that, because it's never happened there before. Anytime the UFC goes into somewhere where they've never experienced it before, the response is always insane. Like there's going to be a crazy amount of people. They're going to treat us like superstars. It's going to be a really, really cool experience. Right on. And now you're back in Montreal uh, preparing with all the killers at the TriStar camp. Uh, are you working with anyone in particular to simulate Zhang LePeng's style? Uh, not really. I don't put too much into that aspect of it. Like, I'm trying to fight people that are a bit more of kickers, that are like big, strong guys. Um, but other than that, I'm just kind of doing what I do, you know? Um, 
with my last fight, I was ex I trained my entire camp expecting a southpaw, and then I come into the cage and the guy is fights me for three rounds as right-handed. So uh, I found that if you put if you think too much into what the person is do is gonna do and you try to predict their style too much, then it can be a detriment in the long run. So really, I'm just more focused on what I'm doing. Um, I believe that I have the ability to beat whatever type of fighter there is out there, and uh, this one will just be another one on the list. All right. Uh, who's going to be cornering you for this fight? Who are you bringing along with you? Uh, well, I was trying to bring Faraz, but he hates flying, this guy, so it's a <laughs> long flight. So uh, I'm bringing uh, uh, Johnny Mucciaroni, who's been working with me on my stand-up for the past couple years now, and uh, Bill Mahood, the butcher, is still going to be cornered. So it's gonna be it's gonna be good. Excellent. All right. Now, what are your thoughts on Zhang LePang as an opponent? Uh, do you feel you fought a higher level of competition in your career than he has? Uh, definitely, I fought a higher level of competition. Um, but that doesn't mean anything really. The the past doesn't determine the future. Only the present does. Uh, he's still gonna be a very strong guy. Uh, he looks like he has some very dangerous weapons. He doesn't have as many weapons I, as I have. But the weapons that he does have are super sharp, so I have to tailor my game to uh, stay away from his strengths and, and bring him to where he is uncomfortable. Uh, as we mentioned off the top, you had a long path to the UFC and had some injury troubles over the past couple of years. Is that something that's a concern to you at this point in your career? Uh, not really. It's just another part of my struggle, you know. It's just a part of my life. I, I could take those things and be like, oh, use them as excuses as to why I can't perform. Like maybe I'm I tend to be more injured during fight camp than other people, and I could use that as an ex as an excuse. But that's not an excuse. Through all of these lessons, through all of these hardships, through all of these failures, I have been able to learn a great many lessons. And because of the lessons that I've learned, it has made me more of a, a better fighter and a better martial artist. Have the injuries or just being a more experienced fighter uh, made you approach the sport differently than you used to? Uh, definitely, definitely. Especially after the last one, I really had to kind of reevaluate my my theories and my philosophy um, behind martial arts. And I'm really now embracing uh, my role as a martial artist. Um, I was kind of my last fight. I kind of fought like a fighter. You know, I, not the most strategic manner. Um, the the way that I approached it wasn't probably the best way that I could have approached fighting a person like Tai Yim Bang. So um, I've really reevaluated my style, and I have uh, have really taken the time to create my own theories and create my own philosophies on the best way to use my specific body type and my specific attributes in martial arts. Were you concerned that uh, the UFC was going to cut you after that KO loss to Taeyeon Bong, or did the performance bonus make you feel safe and kind of take come the, some of the sting out of it? Yeah, well, the bonus definitely helped. It allowed me to, uh, to, to stay healthy without like having to go and try to book another fight because I need money. Um, it really allowed me to take the time, the necessary time to rest, readjust my style and then get back into action when my body and my mind and everything are healthy and ready for it. Um, I didn't think they were really going to cut me. Uh, I was a pretty uh, uh, um, well-watched, uh, well-receptive person on the Ultimate Fighter Nations, uh, which I know they take into account. I'm pretty marketable. Um, and they know that every time I fight that I, I come to scrap. There's n I'm rarely in a boring fight. If I am in a boring fight, it's because my opponent is trying to make it boring, not me. So I didn't think they were going to cut me, um, but I still I don't want to be put into that category of the guys like the uh, the guys that they think are just there to put on a big show um, that are never ever going to be anything that don't ever have a chance to ever uh, be a top contender or go go up for the belt. Uh, I I want to really start to make a statement that I'm here to climb the ranks and uh, I will be the champion. Just as an aside here, how perfect was it that you were fighting in Vancouver, the, the home of BC Bud, and you're fighting a guy named Tyon Bong? 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty good. It was definitely pretty good. <laughs> now you mentioned being a marketable fighter, and uh, clearly you've got an eye out for that. You've got a, a good developed business sense uh, with your clothing line and everything of that nature. How important is that for a fighter today to uh, create their own uh, revenue streams? Uh, being that you know, you said yourself, if you didn't have that performance bonus, you would have been trying to get another fight right away and not necessarily been as healthy when you did it. Yeah, well, the way that the 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 business structure of UFC is going, it's really um, you really do have to make sure you're looking out for yourself. You have to make smart decisions with your money um, because there isn't a lot of money at the bottom right now. There really isn't, and um, we're not really being looked out for in a number of ways. So you can do two things with that. You can be like, oh, these guys, are they don't care about us, they don't care about us. You can do that, or you can take it upon yourself to do whatever you can. Like, you can see the, the UFC for what I believe it is, which is a, a, a platform from which you can launch pretty much whatever you want. Once you're inside that spotlight, it's like the golden key to unlock whatever door you want. If you want to get into film, if you want to have your own business, if you want to make connections and network, this allows you to do that. And through that, that's where you can create the revenue stream. And I don't think a lot of people really see it that way. They believe that um, just because they're a fighter, that fighting should pay them. And it should. In a perfect world, it would. But that's not the world that we live in and you have to realize where we are and do what you can within that world. Have you noticed that there's been a lot more opportunities for you since you were featured on The Ultimate Fighter? Definitely, definitely. It's, uh, it's, once again, it's, it's blown up my name more. Uh, the more publicity I can get, the more media I can do, the more people see me in the spotlight, the more people hear me, uh, the more I can do outside the UFC, outside the Octagon, the more public speaking I can do, motivational speaking, the more seminars I can do, the more people are going to want to buy my clothing line, the more people are going to want me for acting gigs, for stunting gigs. Whatever I want to do, I am able to do it because I am in a spotlight. You're a very outspoken, very well-spoken guy, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation with you today. And one thing I wanted to, to speak to you about, because I know it's an issue that's very passionate uh, in your heart, is you know, being that you're a proud Native Canadian, is the current federal government's treatment of Natives. Uh, here in Canada, Native groups are, are taking a real hard line against Prime Minister Stephen Harper. We've seen things like the Idle No More protests. What is your opinion of the Harper government's uh, attitude towards Natives? Um, well, judging by certain policies that that he's put trying to put into play, um, I don't believe that he has uh, First Nations people's best interest at heart. I think it's actually the opposite. He just sees First Nations people as an uh, like a, a a barrier, an opposition that he has to get over in order to introduce um, big business industry into and, and strip the resources away from Canada to line the pockets of the, the rich and the powerful people in, in these large uh, concrete metropolises that really have no connection to the land that is being used. The grassroots people, be it First Nations, white, black, uh, the people that are grassroots and that are have a connection to the land that are that its livelihood is depending on the land, they are the ones that should be benefiting. If anybody is benefiting, they are the ones that should be benefiting from the stripping away of these resources, and that's not the case. It's always big business, it's always corporations, big oil companies, um, politicians who have their pockets lined. Um, and I just think that I, I, from where, I, where I'm sitting anyway, the Harper government is just furthering that. It's hard to argue with that, uh, seeing everything that's happened over the past couple of years. Another major issue uh, facing Natives, and really we should be talking about more about this as a country as a whole, I think, is at least 1,181 Indigenous women were murdered or disappeared between 1980 and 2012. Why do you think that Harper continues to refuse to call a national inquiry on the issue? It's pretty easy, actually, to see once you understand why and the, the reasons why some of these things are happening is because if he calls an independent public inquiry into this, where somebody that's not one of his lackeys is creating this inquiry, um, a lot of things are going to come out. 
uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about um, why native people are so impoverished. Um, there's going to be a lot of talk about um, how racist some of these policing organizations, the RCMP and other policing organizations uh, within the state of Canada are towards First, native pe First Nations people. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the real reasons behind all of these murdered and missing women, let alone the murdered, missing um, men, the incarcerated men, all of the people in poverty, let alone all of that, there's a lot of reasons that he does not want to shed light on because it will not help him get, uh, it will not help uh, his people, it will not help him um, further his own commercial interests. Well, the RCMP is scheduled to release another report uh, next month, I believe. It's going to be an update on the number of Native women uh, missing or dead. Do you think that will renew calls for a national inquiry on the subject? Maybe, but I don't think as long as, as uh, the, the Harbor government is in power, I don't see anything actually moving forward. I don't think he wants any light shone down that tunnel. I think he wants to keep people's eyes closed as to the real reasons behind these things and uh, keep it just as talk on the internet as news articles. He doesn't want it actually to become a public forum. Yeah. Aboriginal Affairs Minister Bernard Valcourt, he's also been a very controversial figure. I, I was reading something in the Globe and Mail recently and uh, they had a quote from a Valcourt private meeting with Native chiefs. Uh, they quoted Valcourt as saying, I will tell you because there's no media in the room that the RCMP report states that up to 70 percent of the murdered and missing Indigenous women issue stems from their own communities. So, Mr. Valcourt and other Tories, uh, they also they seem to say that they know who's killing Native women. It's Native men. How do you respond to that? Well, for sure that there is a uh, a percentage of these people that it is First Nations on First Nations violence, but that still just stems down to poverty. When you see poverty, you're going to see violence. When you see poverty, you're going to see drug abuse. You're going to see sexual abuse. All of these things really stem from poverty. And then the question is, well, why is there such a hu huge percentage of First Nations populations that are dealing with this massive poverty, this massive um, discrepancy between mainstream Canadians' incomes and First Nations people's incomes? Why is there this huge, huge gap? Well, the reasons all stem back from colonization, really. The massive traumas that people have, have had to endure throughout the generations that can continue this intergenerational cycle of abuse. The problem is so large that a lot of people just don't want to deal with it. And in not dealing with it, we can just scapegoat and be like, oh, well, all these women are killed because it's just the First Nations men. So it must be a First Nations problem. They're, their people are just inherently bad. That's not the way it works. Uh, no person, no racial group is just inherently bad. There's always, there's always more to the story and I don't think that um, these politicians want to really start to delve into the entire story or let alone deal with it. If they can even comprehend the story to begin with. Is there an answer? I, I know that it's you know that there's no one uh, magic bullet, if you will, to to solve uh, th that problem. But well, w what are some of the things that uh, we can do uh, as Canadians, as a society, to, to to help this? Really, it just stems back stems stems from empathy. The more that we can just blame, it's not going to help anything. We need to really try to understand why people are acting the way they are. What have these people gone through that, that causes them to act in the way they do? And if you can show empathy to people and if you can put yourself in their shoes, you may start to realize how we can start to move forward. I don't have all the answers. I'm by no means am I a politician. I'm just a man who has seen both sides of the issue. I grew up on a reservation. But at a young age, when I was about 14, I moved into a city where the majority of my friends were white. And so I've seen both sides. I've seen mainstream society from mainstream people's eyes. I've seen First Nations society from First Nations people's eyes. So I can kind of understand both sides of the story. I don't have a concrete answer, like a, a magic bullet, if you will, that, that we can 
do to help uh, help spur to completely change everything. It's not gonna it's not gonna be one thing. But I think have for me, I would love to see a First Nations prime minister. I think that would be a huge step in the right direction. Or even a prime minister that was that cared about First Nations uh, First Nations people and First Nations issues under really understood First Nations people instead of just seeing them as a barrier to jump over as 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 a uh, a barrier that they need to put it push aside or knock out of the way in order to get what they want. Um, and really, I don't really see that in the current political landscape. I don't feel comfortable voting for any of these parties that are out there right now because they don't have my best interests at heart at all. So you don't think that uh, Justin Trudeau or Thomas Mulcair would be any more sympathetic towards natives than the Harper has been? Um, I think he, they might be better than Harper, but I also am not 100% uh, a, big, a big believer in just choosing the lesser of two evils. I don't think that anything will ever ever get better that way. Like You see the same thing in the states. Oh, George Bush is so bad. George Bush is so bad. Okay, well, Obama is better than Bush, but is he really? Like, has anything really changed? Not much has really changed. So Better, but still not great, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not enough has changed for me to, to be a big believer in that. I think something needs to change within the system. Uh, the system itself needs to change. Uh, how would Canada be different uh, if a Native Canadian was Prime Minister? You, you said that, and it got me thinking. Uh, I think that th there would be a lot more um, validity given to First Nations and given to these or original treaties that were signed, uh, and especially the untreated lands, like these pipelines that are trying to be pushed through through our territories right now in northern BC. All of those territories are unseated. They were never signed, never surrendered to any governmental uh, organization, to, and, and yet the people that live on them still have absolutely no power over their lands. I think that if there was a First Nations Prime Minister that uh, some of these issues would be at least looked on in a different light. That there would be a lot more, um, there, there, there would be just be a lot more stake given to these First Nations people. A lot, they would have more of a voice within Canada. And I was also reading that natives have a lower voter turnout rate than uh, the general population. Do you think the strong opposition to the Harper government could be the thing that galvanizes the native population to head to the polls? Uh, it's possible. It's possible if there if uh, uh, if a party emerges that actually has First Nations people's rights and land rights and treaty rights, if they actually have that at the forefront of their platform. Yeah, that will probably help, but our numbers still aren't big enough where even if all First Nations people went out there and voted for this person, the rest of Canada wouldn't, and we would still be in the same place. Hmm. What are your thoughts about Bill C-51, which uh, gives expansive new powers to CSIS? Uh, it's it's uh, pitched, I guess is the best way to put it, as an anti-terror bill, but as the bill is written now, it could wind up labeling protests like Idle No More terrorist activity. Yeah, I believe that's its actual sole purpose. I don't see um, terrorism being a huge problem in Canada. I think we've had, what, two people die in Canada from terrorism recently, and uh, not to belittle those people in any way or their deaths, but um, in the last 20 years we've had 1,200 missing and murdered Aboriginal women, uh, yet there's a bill being passed about terrorism and there's nothing happening for these First Nations women. It doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, it just It's just fear-mongering. It's just another fear tactic. Okay, there's terrorism. Everybody be scared. Give over your rights uh, for a period of time and we'll give them back to you when everything's safe again. And then they attach all these other measures to it or they just write the bill in a way where they're not very specific on talking about who's going to be labeled terrorists and how we're actually going to label a terrorist organization. Um, and the way the bill is written right now, I'm a terrorist, the way the bill is written right now. Um, I'd probably be like, if this passes, they're going to be surveilling me. 100% they're going to be surveilling me. When I go and protest with my family on our land, 
uh, against these uh, pipelines that are going to be trying to go through, I'm going to be labeled a terrorist. I'm going to be thrown in jail for an indeterminate amount of time um, without due process, without uh, proper trials, just because they can they can slap a sticker on me calling me a terrorist, and that's the end of it. It just doesn't make any sense to me uh, why people are actually getting behind this thing. It doesn't make any sense to me how this could even be brought up in an uh, a, apparently a, what's supposed to be a free society. We just seem to be getting more and more like the states every day, and it's saddening to me. It does seem to be almost a callback to the Patriot Act, Bill C-51 does, and well, we just watched 10 years of uh, the scandals down there with, uh, with the, the NSA spying on everyone left, right, and center, and it, it doesn't seem to have worked there. Why do you think people are supporting it here, having seen empiric evidence that it's not going to work? It's just a fear. Um, with all this ISIS drama, uh, everybody's like, oh my god, ISIS is coming for your children, when really that's not the case. Uh, CSIS is coming for your children, if anybody is. And if the whole ISIS conflict is just another thing altogether. Like, how did ISIS even get created in the first place? Would they even be around if we didn't go in and remove governments and destabilize regions and bomb people, bomb innocent people, and kill innocent people, would they even be an issue? No. So how how is this bill going to help anything when it's just enabling us to do more of the same? All right. And I just uh, on a lighter note, I, I wanted to share this with you. This is uh, something that uh, another native friend of mine uh, posted on their Facebook, and it says, uh, "Where a white man went wrong." Indian Chief Two Eagles was asked by a white U.S. government official, you observed the white man for 90 years, you've seen his wars and his technological advances, you've seen his progress and the damage he's done. The chief not in agreement. The official continued, considering all these events, in your opinion, where did the white man go wrong? The chief stared at the government official, then replied, when white man fi find land, Indians running it, no taxes, no debt, plenty buffalo, plenty beaver, clean water, women did all the work, medicine man free, Indian men spend all day hunting and fishing, all night having sex. Then the chief leaned back and said, and smiled and said, only white man dumb enough to think he can improve a system like that. <laughs> That's so true. So true, man. I wish I, if I could go back in time, I would go back to, um, I would go to Vancouver, Chilliwack area, before colonization, straight paradise, man. Like, they would literally... They had there was so much abundance that they would just all winter long was party. Like they would party and have ceremonies all winter long. And in summer there's just fishing and hunting and gathering and preparing and all winter long they didn't have to gather anything. They didn't have to do nothing. It was amazing. I want that. I don't want to live in this concrete jungle. It's garbage. Yeah, I, I'm really uh, hoping that uh, the Back to the Future uh, time travel DeLorean can, uh, you know, we can get that rolling together because it does seem to we've seemed to come from a, a simpler time to a more complicated time, and everything that they said was going to make things better hasn't necessarily been the case. But yeah. I wanted to close on something that was very personal to you. Uh, a young woman wrote a blog post detailing how you had bullied her when she was a child and the difficulties that she had to endure because of it. You responded to her and not only apologized, but detailed your own experiences being bullied growing up. Why was it important for you to do that? Just because I'm human, man. If I and I grew and I I, I learned through my own struggles, um, and I had affected somebody in a negative way. If I have affected somebody in a negative way, as a human, it's my duty to try to fix that in any way that I can. So I was just trying to be honest with her in any way that I could and outline the reasons behind who I had become at that time in order to treat her that way um, and how I kind of got out of that so she could see the man I've become isn't just some kind of front that I put on and uh, and yeah that's the only reason I did it man is because I'm human and I believe in unconditional love and empathy and so I was honest with her and I showed her unconditional love and in response, and in turn, she showed it to me back, and the issue is closed. Now, if the same type of thing could happen within colonial Canada and First Nations people, I think uh, it would be a much better country to live in. 
Uh, I can't argue with that. What do you wish you could tell that younger version of yourself that, that acted that way? Uh, I would just... I would like to explain to him why he was acting that way and just tell him that there was another way to be. Um, really, at that point in my life, uh, if I had, if I could travel back in time and go and talk to myself, uh, unless I under unless I understood that okay this is me from the future maybe he actually knows what he's talking about really I was just like fuck everything I didn't care about anything and uh, I there's no way I was gonna listen to anybody at that point in, in time so there's not a lot that could have been said to me um, in order to change my behaviors I had to go through difficult struggles I had to have my own uh, my own issues exposed to me. So I would and and allow myself to be honest with myself. That's the only way that it could have it could have changed. I don't think I could have changed just on somebody else's words. Maybe it would have uh, sped up the process a little bit, but I don't think there's anything that I could have said um, in order to just flip a switch and change my brain. Well, the experience that is, the experiences that you've been through have made you the man that you are today, and made you the fighter they are today, and are going to be with you when you. Go into the Philippines May 16th against Zhang Lepang. Cajun, I want to thank you so much for your time today. That This was an amazing conversation. I hope we can do it again in the future. Just let everyone out there know where they can find you in the social media universe and any other thank yous or shout outs you want to give. This is your time, my friend. Okay, man. Thanks a lot. So first I want to shout out uh, P2 Montreal, perform, uh, Premier Performance Montreal, uh, K2 Room Training. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at I am Ragin on Instagram at the Ragin one like the number one and you can find all pretty much all of this all of the above on my on my uh, my website which is www.ragenmma.com all right thanks again Cajun and that's it for me another successful edition of in the cage with bards on in the cage .ca, uh, completed I want to thank everyone out there for watching and listening and uh, don't forget to check out inthecage.ca for other things we have going on. Lots of exciting stuff lately, so be sure to check that out. I am Carlin Bardsley, and until we meet again, the bell has sounded. <laughs>